Hey, good afternoon, everybody. It is Mike Young with a digitalnomad.net, and we are back with CEO of Atlas Motor, it's actually Atlas Motor Vehicles, right? Mark Hanchett. Yep. yep. Thanks for having me, Mike. Yeah, thanks for being here. I can see you're in the facility you have there in Mesa, Arizona. And as, as folks know, we I visited there. It was a couple months ago on the, mm-hmm. our trip, our electric vehicle trip across the country. And you know, you have an awesome setup there, an awesome team. I, I, I remember watching the, the battery demonstration of you uh, charging that battery up. I think in our case, it took about 10 minutes, but still was pretty darn close to what you can do to your best anyway, which is way faster than anybody else, right? Yep. So anyway, well, let's, let's talk about the company because I know that there are still a lot of people that don't know about the company and what you're doing and why you're different. And I mm-hmm. think that these are all things that make the company great. So I want to make sure that we, that we take a little bit of time to go over them. I know, I know we don't have a whole lot of time, but let's start with the fact that I know that some folks have mentioned, mentioned your company, Atlas Motor Vehicles, as an EV truck company, but you're not really just a truck producer, correct? That is correct. So um, on the outside, people emphasize the, the truck itself. Um, and what we're building there. But we think of the truck as sort of our market entry point into a much broader sort of vision that we have. Um, And that broader vision really encompasses everything that has to do with work. So the truck is a foundational technology, tie that into things like cloud services and mobile services and everything else, charging within that ecosystem, and then start bringing other vehicle applications that work in that other equipment applications, everything sort of built on that same base technology platform. Okay, and that's what folks can see behind me here, right? This is your your platform. What's the name of this platform? So we call that the XP platform. Uh, The X means, the X is actually signifies the variations that you can actually have within that. And the P is of course stands for the platform. Um, So we call it the XP. Um, and that is our foundational technology that is powering the vehicles. And then, of course, that same technology can be applied to equipment. All of that sort of works within things like construction and agriculture and those various different things that we call work. OK, so your focus is on more commercial or industrial uses. Is that right? So our, our primary focus is on more commercial or um, it could be an individual buyer, a consumer buyer that but uses that vehicle or that tool for their own personal sort of projects or things that yeah. they do. Um, but yeah, our primary focus is around doing things um, yes. and getting things done. Yeah, it's a, it's a tool. You're making a tool and you're making a tough tool too. Like somebody wants Correct. like the toughest EV, I think you're going to have it when it rolls off the production line. You know? Yep. And that, that's our goal. <laughs> yeah. So let me go over this platform behind me. It's pretty interesting. Now, is the rails that come off the front, the left and the right sides of the battery here, are, is that a frame? Is it an actual frame that it's on? Yeah. So that's the uh, prototype frame that we built the first generation XP on. Um, okay. And that, that it's actually uh, identical and symmetric. So if you were to cut that thing off in the middle, you can mirror it on both sides. Okay. And then some of the words you have, I got this off of your website. It's got four independent traction motors. So that means, you know, uh, just explain to the, your average consumer, why is that different than what's out there on the market already, what's available today? So um, today, the typical approach is a single motor in the rear with a differential that's very similar to what you would have in like a transfer case or in your transmission, or maybe in the rear end of uh, an existing truck today that then splits power left and right. Typically that comes with either a slip differential, which means both wheels can spin independent for the most part. Um, Like one could go faster than the other ones and a power is applied to the other side or comes with like limited slip. What makes us different is that the, uh, and there's only two or three companies that are doing this technically in all four wheels, Mm -hmm. um, is that each motor is directly connected through a gearbox to the, the wheel on the outside, which means we can control speed and traction braking completely independently in each corner. When you say braking, do you need to have actual mechanical brakes to do braking with this setup? So legally, we have to have mechanical brakes to do braking with this separate <laughs> with this setup. But um, we are striving for sort of, you never use those friction brakes. Um, and then we've, we're actually doing something very interesting in that aspect is we're doing independent braking as well in each corner. Um, so gone are the ABS, uh, like sort of traction control systems that are traditional 
gone are all of the hydraulic lines that are run through the vehicle. We eliminated a lot of waste there. Yes, we've yeah. added a few more components, but we've actually, we're working towards complete simplification of that system. Yeah, that's awesome. It's almost like a drivable robot, I suppose, uh, as compared to like a dinosaur or an old school version of an automobile, which has none of those capabilities. Right. Yeah, that's so, awesome. Okay. Go ahead. Oh, no, I was going to say, I mean, one of the cool things with, uh, is sort of a visionary thing is as these things roll off to sort, sort of through production, imagine a scenario where once the platform is finished, there's no longer a carrier that's moving it through the facility. The platform itself is sort of moving itself oh, wow. through the facility. That would be <laughs> kind of a cool concept. Yeah, absolutely. OK, so you touched on this other part. I'm trying to read. Read uh, was it intelligent, independent steering at each axle. So we talked about braking, how legally you have to have pads on this thing, although you may not need them. What about right. steering? How is that translating to the steering aspect? So uh, a lot of people don't know this, but legally you do not have to have a mechanical connection from the wheel down to the steering rack. I didn't um, know. <laughs> now on the, yeah, on the XP, the, um, there is a, uh, our first concept, and actually we're on our second generation steer by wire system, which has no mechanical linkage up to the steering wheel. We're now moving uh, very shortly here. We're moving on to our final uh, production level design, which will actually be independent per corner. Um, so each corner could be steered sort of independent of the other one, which is a very interesting concept. Some people think it's going to add cost and complexity. It adds a software and logic complexity to it, hmm. but we can actually simplify a lot of the challenges we have on the mechanical side by going that particular direction. And then we now have what's called four wheel independent redundancy within the system. So if one sort of fails, the other three can compensate to get you off the road safely. Wow. Um, the same thing can be said with four independent motors, uh, braking systems and steering systems. If the steering system, for some reason, we have some logic fault in there, the motors and brakes can actually do some things to compensate for that to, to get you off the side of the road or stop you quickly yeah. in a safe manner. So you, could you drive if, if one of the motor systems goes out and you have three out of four, could you drive? Yeah, you could keep driving until the last one dies, more or less, okay. as long as there's no like bearing lockup or something in there. Right. Okay. Well, that's awesome because I know that in the, I, I don't dive too deep into the engineering stuff, but you know, I own a Tesla and from what I understand, mm -hmm. Tesla just has some kind of redundancy in the power supply, I think, uh, yes. on the battery pack and also the steering, which they have traditional steering systems, but only a single redundant system, not four you know systems that you have you're talking about which is awesome yeah so that's 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 another measure of safety and just usability i guess if something breaks you can fix it later rather than right away right <laughs> right it, the idea is to get you somewhere safely so there before we can repair it and then from a design perspective everything that we're doing from a production standpoint is designed to be outside of the battery pack that's the one caveat we have to add there um, everything right. else is sort of repairable on the side of the road. Okay. Okay. Now let me also kind of go over some things we talked about in the past that most folks may probably don't even know about still is something that makes your company different and better. In my opinion, is the speed of the charging system that you have, that you're developing. Yep. Right. So can you describe what's out there now that people, you know, like I've got a, a an electric vehicle, what, what my experience or, or the best experience is that's out there now versus what you're going to deliver. So I think the, the best way to describe the existing experience is inconsistent. Um, there are systems like Porsche that can do 22 minutes to 80%, I think is their best time. Uh, there are other companies that are, that are developing new cars, new trucks that maybe take hours to charge, or there's some new car out there, but it's never consistent. Every time you stop, that same sort of 10 to 80% isn't always say 22 minutes as the Porsche example, right? It could be 30 minutes, 40 minutes, could be an hour. It could be 22, could be 28. It, it's very sort of variable. And there's all these things that play into it. Uh, you have to preheat before you get to the station, which means you have to plan it, which means it can't be cold outside, right? If it's the middle of winter and it's negative 20 degrees outside, you're never yeah. going to preheat that battery pack before you get to the station to be able to charge quick enough. If you ever, uh, there's another YouTuber out there, Bjorn, he does these long distance yeah. trips, right? And uh, he, he talks about, um, you know, all these different vehicles and not being able to 
get consistency unless he drives really fast, really hard to, to be able to charge that. Yeah. What Atlas. That, does, yes, yeah. yeah. <laughs> what, what Atlas, yeah. What Atlas does different is one, we're developing a battery cell that's specifically designed to build that consistency. Then we're building the pack technology that ties into that. And of course, all the thermal management and charging technologies and what that in the end delivers is a very consistent sort of plug in 15 minutes later, unplug, ready to go, yeah. whether it's negative 20 or it's 50 C, which is about 120 plus degrees Fahrenheit yeah, outside. I, I can attest that that is a, 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 a great thing uh, when you'll be able to do that with an Atlas vehicle, because, you know, even if you preheat that battery or try either mm. by the system in your car, knowing you're driving to the battery charger uh, or you flooring it until you get there it, it probably isn't going to be enough and that just that assumes that you remember that you're actually doing that and don't just say, say oh well i'm low on battery i forgot i gotta plug in now because if you do that's gonna be a worst case scenario and that happens more often than not in the real world right it means you have to plan every detail of your trip or maybe yeah. it's just you're you're out you know shopping on a saturday or sunday and all of a sudden you know you have to plan that whole trip to yeah. be able to get that experience <laughs> Uh, and then it's not consistent depending on where you are and what the environmental conditions are. Okay. And then I've solved this uh, special charger that you have, which looks massive, uh, mm -hmm. that'll, that'll provide these fast charges. That's going to be proprietary. You can have your own network, right? But it's going to be backwards compatible to other networks. Is that correct? Correct. So um, we're looking at what's happening in the, the rest of the industry, but um, there's a proprietary sort of interface and workflow and and technology that's gonna go into the Atlas charging systems and the Atlas vehicle that allows us to do that consistent experience. But of course, yeah, that will always be backwards compatible to like CCS and everything else. It will also be compatible for other OEMs to come in and, and or other vehicles that are maybe not necessarily Atlas to participate and work within that Atlas ecosystem. Okay, and now another difference between what you're doing and others have done, at least let's, let's go to Tesla. Obviously Tesla does not, their vehicles don't charge anywhere near as fast as what you're talking about. Uh, they have problems with preheating a battery uh, and or just not being ready to charge if you just show up at a charger. Also the truck that they're building is not a body on frame, it's a unit body. So you can't customize it like you can with your vehicles, right? Correct, so in sort of that work and do stuff and get stuff done theme, one of the aspects of that is customization for your particular need. Uh, so if you're a contractor, maybe you're an electrician, a plumber, maybe you're a general contractor, maybe you work in the agriculture business, maybe you work in heavy equipment, you have different pieces of equipment and tools that have to be attached to it and giving them the flexibility to be able to facilitate the use of all those different tools, different bed types, different yeah. crane systems, different whatever it is, that is kind of key to um, being able to provide a, a value-driven product for those particular markets. Absolutely. It sounds like you know your market, you know what the the folks buying these vehicles are going to want, and you're, you're, you're going to deliver to them. And you've got all these components, you've got everything working for you, you've got that vision, is this going to cost an arm and a leg? That's what I want to know. And I'm sure that everybody else wants to know that too. <laughs> well, um, from a, from a development standpoint, it sometimes feels like it's going to cost an arm and a leg. Okay. Um, but it, no, from the vehicle standpoint, we're trying to keep cost comparable to existing vehicles in the market today that sort of operate in that particular environment. Uh, total cost of ownership is always a big discussion. It's always a big thing, but sticker shock is a bigger thing. It's yeah. that one thing where you look at it up front and say, oh my gosh, this thing's going to cost that much. Yeah. The Hummer, right? You saw that the Hummer is over a hundred thousand to start. That's what right. I saw. <laughs> so, right. Oops. And it's it, at that point, it's a niche vehicle that operates in a very small segment of the market. And if it doesn't have the rest of the ecosystem, it doesn't matter. It won't. Yeah. Where, whereas we're looking at, um, People that work in sort of the market areas, the, the work segments that we think about, um, sticker price is a big thing for them, uh, as well as sort of total cost of ownership. So we're, we're looking at a subscription-based model. We're looking at direct purchases, as well as subscription-based for all of the nuances that come with that. Yeah, um, I saw so, that on your site. Yes, that's awesome. Yeah, so we're really trying to get that to a point where it makes it easy for someone to say yes versus the long debate of cost. Yeah. And one of the subscriptions I saw, if I was reading correctly, is that you are going to offer some kind of a subscription to your charging network. Is that right? 
Correct. So um, we'll offer a subscription for charging uh, as well as various other services um, within that. And then, of course, uh, for the vehicle itself. And the beautiful thing of that is, especially for those that aren't looking to fork over a lot of capital up front, you, sometimes you want to hang out of that cash. Yeah. Is you can plan from a budgetary standpoint exactly what it's going to cost. There are no variations in there. It's just this is what it's going to cost. That's what it's going to be. Um, and because you're able to plan like that, especially if you're a fleet operator, yeah. Oh, yeah. you can focus on your core business and your bottom line is very dependable and you don't have to worry about upcoming massive capital expenses that sometimes occur when you're talking about fleets and rolling out vehicles and, and things like that. Yeah, especially if you're doing a lot of just a lot of work, you're towing trailers, you're doing all kinds of things. You don't know what your electric bill is going to be. But if you get that subscription, that sounds like a very attractive option to folks who are just right. in any kind of business, really. Yeah, if uh, if I can offer a prediction um, in 10 years, the concept of paying for consumption of electricity, I think, is going to disappear oh. in 10 in 10 years. It'll be you pay for access and consumption will be relatively limitless. I, I think there's nice. going to be an abundancy of energy available. And therefore, the idea of I'm going to consume too much will be a thing of the past. Awesome. Well, you guys have so many new and innovative ideas. And, and I just, I, I'm hopefully this video is serving to get that word out to folks. One last thing I want to mention mm -hmm. that I think is very innovative about your company is that you can actually invest in your company and become an early investor, even at this point in time. Is that right? Correct. So um, very unique to Atlas, uh, unlike anybody else in the industry, uh, is that you, an everyday person, a business owner, maybe somebody who's interested in the product and the fleet, um, you're not just, we're not asking for deposits. You can actually become an investor. You can own a piece of the company. That is a uh, sort of revolutionary thing that's yeah. kind of grown up over the last couple of years. It means you're getting in at the, at the earliest of stages that's typically only reserved for the ultra wealthy um, individuals yeah. of the world. And this is an opportunity for you to get in there and sort of share in the benefits and success that we have here at Atlas. Okay. And all the stuff is on your website, right? Even including the investing part. Yeah. So if you're interested in investing, uh, check out our website at invest.atlasmotorvehicles.com, A-T-L-I-S motorvehicles.com. All right. Well, Mark, thanks so much for the updates. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm very hopeful that we'll be giving more amazing updates in the future as we see these trucks actually roll off of your, uh, you're going to have an assembly line there, I think, right? In Mesa, in Mesa or at least partially. Correct. It's it's going to be right here, right behind me. <laughs> yeah. And I, and I was there. Yeah. So I saw it. And, uh, you know, I, I look forward to more talks in the future and watching the company grow. And, you know, it's something that, you know, if I look at who's a real innovator out there right now in this space, I would have to say right now, it's you guys are at the top. You know, Thank I mean, you. You, you've got, you, you know, a market that is, that is crying out for something like this. And you're, you're going right after it. So I, I applaud you. And, and anybody who's seen me do my long distance towing knows that the sad state of the EV market right now in terms of towing anything of weight long distance, it's, it's a struggle. And you guys are going to fix it all, hopefully. Absolutely. <laughs> We're going to solve that problem. Okay. Well, thank you, Mark. Right. Thanks so much. Uh, look forward to talking again. Thanks, Mike. You're welcome. Bye-bye.